In this lecture, I would like to talk about the... I'd like to give you a big picture, a perspective of God's purpose in the Christian's life in suffering. Uh, we will talk about specific things, but I want to talk about the, the biggest picture, first of all, of why there is suffering. Not why there is suffering in the world. Um, this question we have proposed a, 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 a slight answer to in our last session, though I don't wish to uh, pretend that we have answered all the mysteries about that. But um, I do want to talk about why do Christians suffer? I remember uh, when I was a child, my father once uh, had the minister over. It's not that my father would not be pleased to have the minister over more often. Our minister had a fairly large church and didn't visit all the families all the time. And well, I remember one time in my youth, our pastor came to our home and um, spent the evening talking about the things of God with my parents, who my parents are Christians. And I remember as he was leaving, uh, my father said, you know, I, I, I've always had this one question and maybe you could answer it for me. And to tell you the truth, uh, I don't remember whether the minister was able to answer it. The question stood out in my mind because when my father posed it, I thought, well, that's a good question. And I certainly didn't know the answer either uh, at that time. But my father said to the minister, he said, I can understand why God would allow the devil to test us and to try us and so forth before we become Christians. Uh, so that we might be, you know, we might make a choice in the, you know, in the midst of uh, options and so forth, and and that our our choice for God would be one that is uh, responsible and one that we've turned our back on one thing in order to choose Him. But he says, once we've chosen to be Christians, why doesn't God then just say to the devil, okay, back off? They've made their choice; they're mine. Just leave them alone. And uh, that seemed to me like a good question. Uh, and I didn't at the time know the answer. And uh, what, if our pastor answered it adequately, I must not have been paying as much attention to his answer as I was to the question because I remember the question, but I don't remember the pastor's answer. But I think I know the answer. Uh, you know, Jesus, when he was praying for his disciples in John chapter 17, just prior to his arrest and therefore the last uh, intercessory prayer for his disciples that we know of that he offered, uh, he included this, this uh, petition. Jesus said in John 17, 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Now, he does want us to be kept from the evil one in the sense that he doesn't want us to be overcome by the devil. But when he says, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, this is kind of disappointing in one sense. I mean, I'd kind of like to be taken out of the world. Many, most Christians I know are really looking forward to the rapture. Really would like to think that the rapture would occur soon. I mean, the world is a place of sorrow and disappointment and pain and, and what we haven't experienced yet, we don't know, but that we might later in life. I mean, there's all kinds of anticipated fears of pain and so forth and suffering. And we just know that on the day that the rapture occurs, when God takes us out of this world, that will be the end of all suffering and sorrow and crying and pain and all of that. And uh, most of us kind of fondly look forward to that. And, well, we should. Paul spoke of himself and others of like mind as those who love his appearing. And one of the reasons we love his appearing, I hope, is because we love the Lord and are eager to see him. Another is that we realize that that will be the end of the trials. That'll be the end of suffering for us who are his. But Jesus said, Father, I, don't, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world. And I think, why? Why not? Well, I'm sure there's more than one part of the answer. I can think of two. One is that the world needs us. But another is I think we need the world. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. But I think that the world as a place of suffering is a place that we must be in order to reach certain goals that God has for us to reach. You remember that Peter has said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 that we are like living stones being built up into a spiritual house, a holy temple. The church, corporately seen as a whole, is a, a temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
individuals, members of the body of Christ, are likened to stones being assembled into that temple. And that gives us good reason to believe that the temple in, that the Jews worshipped in was perhaps a type of the church, the church being a spiritual antitype or counterpart of the temple in the Old Testament. And there are some things about the temple in the Old Testament that perhaps are instructive about, about the church too, as a temple. One of the things that I came across years ago, as I was um, studying Solomon's life in First Kings and the building of the temple, was a verse that, if I, I hope I can find it again, because it's a very interesting verse. In fact, I taught through First uh, Kings not long ago, and I'm sure I probably made this point. Um, I believe it's in chapter 6. Yes, and verse 7, 1 Kings 6, 7. This is describing Solomon's building project when he was building the temple. It says, And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone, finished at the quarry, so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. Now, the stones of Solomon's temple were perfected to a very high degree. According to Josephus, they were so smooth there that when you assembled them together, there was no crack or crevice that a wisp of air could get through. In fact, they were so smooth they didn't even bother to use mortar between the stones <coughs> because uh, didn't need to, there were no holes to patch. There was no, there was no reason to cover in imperfections on the edge. There were no imperfections on the edge. To, uh, for a stone to be assembled into the temple, it had to be perfected. It had to have perfectly smooth edges. It had to be able to set up against another stone, which would also have perfectly smooth edges. And in relation to all the other stones in the wall, it had to be perfectly fitted. Now, this is not, of course, the condition in which stones are uh, usually found in nature. If you build a stone building, and if you go to find some stones, let's say you were a homesteader back when you couldn't just go down to a, a hardware or building supply store and buy the stone you want. Let's say you had, you were living in the days of a little house in the prairie and decided to build your house of stone, and you found a, uh, a cliff side that was made of the right kind of stone, you decided to start chipping rocks out of there to build your house with. Uh, when you start obtaining stones from nature, uh, the place from which you do it is called the quarry. There's actually a rock quarry on the property right next door to my home. And um, and it's not in use anymore, but there's a big hole in the ground where there used to be a lot of rock that's been hauled out of there. And the quarry is the place where you find stone in its natural condition. But if you are to build a house of the sort that the temple was, and if the stones must qualify to that high standard of perfection that the stones were subjected to, which Solomon used in building the temple, those stones must be changed a great deal from the state they are found in nature to the state that they must be found in at the time of assembly, at the time when they are finally brought to the temple site and assembled together in their final form. This process of change requires, of course, chiseling and the use of hard tools and removal of parts of the stone that simply uh, protrude in, in an uh, inopportune direction. <laughs> uh, there has to be a shaving off of, the, of much of its own mass. There has to be a breaking of the stone on, on certain portions. And these things, if the stones were living stones, as we are, these things would be a painful process. The chiseling of a stone, of course, does not hurt the stone because a stone has no feelings. But the temple of the Holy Spirit is built of living stones. And as such, living stones can sense when that chiseling process is underway. Now, it says that these stones in Solomon's temple were chiseled and prepared to perfection at the quarry. It was not deemed desirable that a person at the temple mount, at the temple site, should be able to hear all the clamor and the noise of the hammering and chiseling and, and sawing and all the things they did to shape these stones. And so they did all the work of perfecting the stones at the quarry. 
when the stones were perfected, they were then assembled together in their final home, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now, bear that in mind. Of course, you can easily see without my making the connection how this would relate to why we need the world or why Jesus did not pray that we'd be immediately taken out of the world. Someday, he intends to call us all to himself, to the site of the ultimate location of the new Jerusalem and assemble us there. And his glory will fill that place and will fill us. But the stones are imperfect. This world is the quarry where God has found the stones. And he's found us in a natural state that is not conducive to the final end and final function that he has in mind for us in eternity. Therefore, we find that just as Solomon's workers prepared the stones at the quarry and then brought them to the temple site, so God is preparing us as living stones, to become made more perfect so that we might be assembled into a holy and glorious temple also ultimately and that his glory might fill that temple. Let me uh, call attention to certain scriptures if I might. Look at 1 Thessalonians. I, I'll be prepared to look at quite a few scriptures in rapid succession here. But I would appreciate it if you did turn to them and look at them. It'll help to uh, get the thought into your mind two ways, through the ear and the eye. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12, Paul says that you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I want you to hold on to that word glory. God calls you to his kingdom and he calls you to glory. Look over at 2 Thessalonians now, chapter 2. And verse 14. In first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says, To which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, God called us to his kingdom and he called us to glory. Here, Paul says, he, God has called us by the gospel. He has called us to or for the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's possible that you've read phrases like this before and your mind has just gone over them and you've never asked any question, what in the world does that mean? But I'd like to get you to ask that question. I'd like to pose that question. What in the world does that mean, that we're called to glory? You know, a lot of times, I think, in Christian tradition, there's such a vague concept of what this word glory means that it's just been made a synonym in the minds of many for heaven. So you've got, you know, traditional songs, you know, I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun way beyond the blue. Well, way beyond the blue suggests way out in heaven. There's this glory land. And there's a lot of talk in Christian hymnody and sermons and so forth of glory, uh, as if that's a place that we go to. We go to glory. Um, and that means heaven. Well, I, I don't want to disassociate glory from heaven too very much because I'm sure that heaven is a glorious place. But when Paul says that God has called us to his kingdom and he's called us to glory, or that he's called us to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, I personally have come to believe that Paul has a specific notion that he refers to and means when he says the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, the hope of the Christian is the hope of obtaining that glory. We see that, for example... In Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5, verse 2, Paul says, Through whom, that is through Jesus Christ, also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay, so the, the glory of God 
This is the hope that we rejoice in. Well, in what sense do you rejoice in hope of the glory of God? What is meant by the glory of God? Well, what is your hope? Well, I thought my hope was to go to heaven. Well, I, maybe so. But is that what Paul means when he says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God? Well, look over at Colossians. Colossians uh, chapter 1 and verse 27. This is a very well-known verse. Paul says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which, mystery is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now here we have again the hope of glory. We hope in the glory of God, Paul said in Romans 5.2. Here he tells us that the mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. Now, Christ in me, how is that connected with a hope of glory? Well, maybe just the hope of heaven. I don't think so. Uh, you'll see why as we move along. But uh, I want to know, you to notice that the hope of the Christian is somehow associated with the glory of God and the glory of Christ. In fact, look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Paul says that we are looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ certainly sounds as if that's nothing other than the second coming of Christ, but I call your attention to the fact that if you uh, looked it up in the interlinear Greek version, you would find that the phrase glorious appearing is actually the appearing of the glory. In fact, uh, the New American Standard renders it that way. It's the New American Standard quite correctly uh, renders it, as does the Greek. The King James and New King James and the NIV do not render it quite as accurately, it would appear. Because if you look this up in the Greek New Testament, it says, we're looking for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I realize that the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ might well be a reference to the second coming of Christ as as easily as the glorious appearing, as rendered here, might be. But it might not be. The wording allows for another thought. The hope of the Christian is the appearing of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has called us to the obtaining of the glory of Jesus Christ. We rejoice in the hope of glory of God. It the hope of the Christian and the mystery of the gospel is about Christ in you who is the hope of glory. Now, what I've sought to call attention to in these verses is that to Paul, anyway, and I believe that he was not at all alone in this. We can see this in Peter also, especially in First Peter. Glory is what the Christian is destined for. In fact, glorification is considered to be the third aspect of salvation in general that almost all theologians would agree, even if they have different opinions about what is meant by the glory of God, uh, all would agree that salvation is of three uh, aspects. You've got justification, which is, of course, being regarded as innocent. That, that deals with the legal problem between you and God, uh, any kind of uh, guilt, residual guilt that might stand between you and God is eliminated by what we call justification. God justifies you. He declares you innocent. Uh, so any legal barriers between you and God are taken care of by justification. Then there's sanctification, which is part of salvation also. And it's an ongoing, as I understand it, process of battling against sin and overcoming sin and becoming more holy. The word sanctified comes from the root uh, that means holy. And to be sanctified means to be made holy. That's a process it's not, uh, it's not just like justification, which is a legal transaction. It's, it's a practical matter of the way you actually live your life. And then there's glorification, which is the third aspect of salvation. And that is when we are, that's the consummation of our salvation. That's when we uh, finally uh, are in the state that salvation intends to bring us to, to be glorified. And there's, by the way, we could multiply verses. We don't have time because we have other points to make here. But we could multiply verses showing you the various passages that talk about sanctification and justification and glorification. And all of these are a part of our salvation. They're, 
it has been said that this is sort of the past, present, and future aspects of salvation. Uh, justification deals with the guilt of sins of the past. Sanctification deals with the present struggle with sin. And glorification deals with the future deliverance, total deliverance from sin. Or as some preachers have put it, justification deals with the problem of the penalty of sin. Sanctification deals with the problem of the power of sin in our lives today. And glorification deals with the problem of the presence of sin. In other words, by justification we're delivered from the penalty of sin. By sanctification we're delivered from the power of sin. And by glorification we're delivered from the presence of sin, the very presence of sin. And therefore glorification is the end of salvation toward which we look. Now Paul speaks of our hope is the glory or obtaining the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what in the world is meant by that? Or is it in the world at all? Is it somewhere else? Well, you know, it's interesting that the same prayer that where Jesus said, Father, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world. He also says, I want you to share, I want them to share with me my glory and see my glory and, and all of that. There's a, his concern for the church was their ultimate glorification. And we know that Paul said in Romans 8, uh, 28 and 29, actually 29 and 30, uh, Paul said, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his Son. And those that he predestinated, he also called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. So the ultimate end for the Christian is to be glorified. Now, what all does it mean to be glorified? What does it mean to participate in the glory of Jesus? Well, look over at the Gospel of John. It may seem like we're looking at an awful lot of verses today, but it's, it is a lot, but it's not an awful lot. It's a wonderful lot of verses. John 1 and verse 14 says, The, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I've told you before this word dwelt means tabernacled or pitched his tent, uh, lived in a tabernacle among us, meaning that body of Jesus was the tabernacle. And it says, we beheld his glory. Now, just as in the tabernacle of Moses, the people saw the glory cloud fill, fill the tabernacle, so John says, when we saw Jesus, it was like seeing the tabernacle. God, the Word, was tabernacling with us, and we saw the glory there. But then he goes on and explains what he means by the glory. He says, it's, it was the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This verse is so rich I could spend the rest of the time talking about it and not say everything I'd like to say about it. Let me just point out a few items. When God gave Moses the instructions about the erecting of the tabernacle as a house for the glory of God, Moses on the mountain said, God, show me your glory. And God said, you can't do that. You can't see my glory and live. No man can see my face and live. Interesting, he, God used the word my face and my glory interchangeably in that conversation. But we won't bother with that at the moment, but you might want to put that in the back of your mind for later reference. But God, Moses said, show me your glory. And God said, no one can see my face and live. But he said, I will pass by. I'll put you in a crevice of the rock and I'll put my hand over there. I'll pass by. And when I pass by, I'll let you look and you can see my hinder parts. And I will declare to you the name of the Lord. Now, the revelation of God to Moses... Uh, the, the disclosure of the glory of God to Moses on that occasion took the form of God declaring his own nature and character to Moses. He said, I'll declare, Moses, uh, God actually said, I will declare to you the name of Jehovah and my glory shall pass by and so forth. And it was part and parcel with, um, with, with a learning of the glory of God and having that revealed to him that Moses had this description of God made by God himself. Um, not having intended to bring this particular passage up, it came off the top of my head, I don't have the exact reference. It's in um, 33, 7, yes. Is that where it is? 34? Okay, it's in that general area, yes. 
Okay, yeah, at the end of chapter 33 is when Moses makes his request. And, and God responds and says, So it will be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in a cleft of the rock, I will cover you with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Then in chapter 34, it actually happens. And when God passes by, he declares his own name to, to uh, Moses. And again, I don't have that verse at the... Uh, uh, just before me, but he says, you know, Jehovah, merciful and gracious. Uh, do you see that there? Here it is, yes, verse 6, verse 6 and 7 of the chapter 34. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, Jehovah, Jehovah God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Now, he goes on and talks so, some more about himself, but but what's interesting here is this is the disclosure of the glory of God to Moses. It was a declaration by God himself of his own nature, of his own character. And it says, in particular, in the bottom line there in verse 6, is abounding in goodness and truth. And different translations render that differently. But many scholars believe that when John said of Jesus, we saw his glory, he was full of mercy and truth, or full of grace and truth. That this is John's own translation or John's own uh, echo of God's words about his own glory and his own character when he said that Jehovah is abounding in goodness and truth. John says Jesus was full of grace and truth. Grace being substitute for goodness only in that case. And therefore, there is a possibility that John is alluding in this one verse in John 1.14 to several aspects of God's glory in the Old Testament. The tabernacle and the disclosure of his glory to Moses. And, uh, you know, Moses didn't get to see the face, but, but John did. John got to see his face. And uh, we, he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This full of grace and truth could be John's way of echoing saying, the same glory of God that was declared and revealed to Moses on the mountain there is, was here revealed to us in this new tabernacle of the body of Jesus when he dwelt among us. Now, the statement in that verse, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, is not a quite accurate translation because it says the Son of the Father, or the only begotten of the Father, and both thes are absent in the Greek. There is no definite article here. Therefore, it can be and probably should be translated a Son, or an only begotten, of a Father. Now, this is not in any way to deny the relationship of father-son relationship with, between Jesus and God. I'd have to excise, you know, huge portions of Scripture to try to deny that, and I have no motive to do so. But the question is, what was John saying in this particular statement? We beheld the glory of Jesus. It was like seeing the glory of an only begotten son of a father. Now, I'm going to suggest to you, as a working hypothesis something and then I'll show you scriptures that have confirmed this hypothesis to my mind as a correct one and that is that the glory well before I tell you this hypothesis let me give you a little more broad understanding of what the word glory means the word glory doxa in the Greek means a number of things and in some cases of course we think of glory as honor or or a fame or uh, good report or uh, being a celebrity, getting a lot of glory, getting a lot of credit. A glory hog is that player on the team who always makes sure he gets the ball and doesn't pass it to anyone else. He wants to make the plays. He wants all the glory. Okay? He wants all the attention, all the honor, all the credit. That's how we use the word glory frequently. And biblically, that's, that is a legitimate use of the word. But it's not the only use of the word. Additionally to that kind of use of the word glory, the Bible uses the word glory in the sense uh, more or less of radiance. Like the glory of the sun is different than the glory of the moon. And even on the occasion when Moses saw God's hinder parts, we are told in the New Testament that there was a glory on Moses' face that he had to cover because it unnerved his observers. Oh, a glory on his face? What's a glory? What was, what was actually, what was the case with Moses face after all it shone it radiated there was light beams coming from it right 
I mean, he covered his face because his face was shining. This is said to be the glory on his face, like the radiance or the glory of the sun, the glory on Moses' face. Uh, the term is used that way in Scripture, not infrequently. The excellent glory. Um, Jesus, when he was transfigured, the glory of God was seen on him. He was glorified and his face shone like the sun. And so, sometimes the word glory actually speaks of the radiance or brilliance of a, of a light shining. That's why it says in Revelation that the city had no need of the sun or the moon or the stars to shine in it because the glory of God and, the, and of the Lamb lighten it. So the word glory sometimes has that meaning of honor or credit or fame, but it also sometimes has the meaning of just simply radiance. Now there's a sense in which especially that second meaning of glory is radiance is used figuratively in Scripture as if to mean an image of someone. Let me show you what I mean here. In Hebrews chapter 1, the meaning of this word glory, by the way, as used in Scripture, is, is fairly important since so many Scriptures speak of it, and it is our hope. Uh, I do believe it's important for us to have a grasp of what is meant when the Bible uses this term. But in Hebrews chapter 1, <coughs> in verse 3, it's speaking about Christ. Hebrews 1, 3, it says, Who, Christ, being the brightness of his glory. There's like the radiance aspect. Christ is the brightness of God's radiant glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he admits, etc., etc. Et now, notice these two phrases in juxtaposition. Christ is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. I'm going to suggest to you, and I'll demonstrate it from other scripture, that biblical writers are known at times to use the word glory in a way that we might interchangeably put in the word image. What do you, when you look at the sun, do you see the sun? Well, yes. You see the glory of the sun. You see the image of it. You, see, you get a view of it. Your mind receives an image. Uh, it is the radiance of the sun that you see, but it is the image of the sun presented to your mind through the, the radiance of it. Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. It is said in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11 by Paul, that woman was made in, is the image and the glory of man. Do you remember that statement ever? ever run across that one? Um, let me find it here. It's, uh, or it's, it's a little different than that. It doesn't say it quite like that. It's in 1 Corinthians 11, 7. It says, For man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Now, he might just be abbreviating the, the statement in the second clause. He might mean woman is the image and the glory of man. I don't know. But the point here is that man is said to be the image and glory of God. Is there a difference between being the image of God and the glory of God? I don't know. The two thoughts are associated very closely, at least, if not interchangeable. Just as Christ is the brightness of God's glory and he's the express image of his person, so here, man is said to have been made in the image and glory of God. There's a close association, if not identity, between the concept of the image and of the glory in such a case as this. There's more, more to go on than just that. Um, going back to John 1.14, where it says that we beheld his glory, the glory as of an only begotten of a father. In speaking of the glory, as you might expect to see in the only begotten Son of a Father, what is the most likely meaning of that? But that the Father's resemblance is seen in His Son. That's how it was when we saw Jesus. When the Word was made flesh, it's as if we were seeing the resemblance of a Father in the face of His Son. Now look over here. 2 Corinthians, 
It might seem like I'm just multiplying proof texts, but actually these are moving in a certain direction. Since the Bible's full of this concept, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, Moses was not able to look at the face and glory of God and see his image. But God, through Jesus has allowed us to see the light of the glory, the light of his glory in the face of Jesus. The image, the likeness, the glory. These are terms that are seemingly being used quite interchangeably. In fact, it's obviously the case in 2 Corinthians 3.18, just a few verses prior to the one I just read. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says... But we all with unveiled face, unlike Moses who veiled his face, we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Do you see the likelihood that Paul is using the word glory and image interchangeably there? We are beholding the glory of the Lord, and as we behold that glory, we're changed into that image from glory to glory. In other words, the glory of the Lord is the image of the Lord, the likeness of Christ in us. Remember now the verse we read a moment ago in Colossians 1, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ reproduced in you, Christ replicated in you, his image seen upon you. Look what the psalmist said. Back in, uh, I think it was Psalm 4. Hope it is, because I don't want to look all over the Psalms for it. Here it is. Psalm 4 and verse 6. says, There are many who say, Who will show us any good? In this prayer, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance, that's your face, upon us. There's a world out there who needs to see some good. They doubt there is any to be seen, and we want to surprise them. We want to address their, redress their cynicism by his face, the light of his face being seen upon us. If they could just see the character of God, if they could just see the character of Christ, the likeness of Christ in us, this would help to put away such cynicism as uh, is uh, generally widespread, that there's really no righteousness, there's really no goodness. Well, if God's face could be seen upon us, if his image were in our lives, that would certainly change things. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And the hope of the glory of God is, in my understanding, simply the hope of being like Jesus. Not like Jesus in the sense of, well, what would Jesus do? I'll do that. But in the sense that there's a Jesus embodied the glory of God internally. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the glory shining through the skin, as it were. Not not literal light, except on the occasion of the transfiguration. Uh, Jesus actually did glow on that moment. And that, I think, is simply that his, in all likelihood, God did that as as an emblem of, of what was really in Jesus all the time. It was just not usually visible to the naked eye, that he is full of the glory of God and the disciples got a glimpse of it on that occasion. But in Romans 8, which I quoted earlier, it speaks of those that God predestined, he also called, and he, those that he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorifies. That is God's ultimate end for those that he has predestined. But notice what this glorification is, actually means. We could say, based on Romans 8, 29, and 30, that what God has predestined us for is glorification. Because that's what's the bottom line in that lengthy chain of phrases. But notice verse 29. Whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That is what being glorified is. He has predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his Son. And therefore he called us, justified us, and glorified us. 
that glorified, I think, is a more of a statement of faith in, in, in future glorification than anything, but it's, it's, it's established. God knows who will be glorified, and in his mind it's already a done deal. But the fact is, he has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's why we change from glory to glory into that image. As we behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Now, what's interesting here about Romans 8, 29, interesting for our present discussion, it says, He predestined to be conformed to the image of, of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, Jesus' glory that was seen by the apostles was like the glory of an only begotten Son of a Father. A unique likeness. If a man has only one son, then there aren't any other sons who rival that one for bearing the image of their father or the glory of their father or the inheritance or whatever. Now, that only begotten has it all. But Paul says God's design is not that Jesus be the only one glorified, not that Jesus be the only one who's like himself, but he wants us to be conformed to his image so that he might simply be the firstborn not the only one, but the firstborn of many brethren, which suggests that the glory that was seen in Jesus is not forever to be a glory of an only begotten, but of a firstborn of many. Now look at the parallel statement in Hebrews 5. I discovered all these things in my own study of the scriptures on my own years ago, and, and they were so exciting to me at the time. I don't know if I can convey the, uh, the sense of, uh, of excitement that I had. It's not chapter 5, it's chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2. Um, it says in verse 10, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now check this out. There are connected threads between this verse and the one we just looked at in Romans 8.29. What was that? In 8.29 of Romans, Paul said that God predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son so that he might be the firstborn of many. Now here's another reference to the many sons. But instead of saying many would be made in the image, it says many sons will be brought to glory. The ideas are interchangeable. God wants Jesus to be the firstborn of many sons in that image, and therefore he's predestinated us to be conformed to that image. The same concept is here in different words. He's bringing many sons to glory. Now, this is the connecting link to our next thought along uh, in this thread of thought. And that is, it says in the same verse, Hebrews 2.10, in bringing many sons to glory, God, it suited God to make the author of their salvation perfect or to, or to bring him perfectly into glory himself through sufferings. He's the forerunner into this glory. And uh, he, in one sense, was perfected in that role through sufferings. There is a link in the Bible, throughout the Bible, between sufferings and glory. In Luke chapter 24, when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus with the two men who did not yet recognize him, they had heard that he'd risen from the dead, but had not seen him. Uh, he is talking with them, and he finds their, um, their lack of faith uh, offensive. And he says in Luke 24, verses 25 and 26 he said to them O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory now they they believed in the glory of the Messiah but they didn't understand that he should suffer these things and he says don't you realize that the Messiah prior to entering into, into his glory must suffer these things isn't it only right didn't the prophets say it that he must suffer and then enter into glory. Now, it's not just a chronological relationship of suffering and glory. It's a causal relationship. In other words, it's not just that we suffer now and later the suffering will be over and we'll have glory instead. 
it's not just like two chronological states. It's a cause and effect relationship. Look at over Romans, or no, Acts 14. 14. And in verse 22, it says that Paul and Barnabas on their way home to Antioch from their first missionary journey visited again the churches that they had established on their way out from home and now going back, they're retracing their steps. And what were they doing on their way home? It says they were strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Now, many tribulations, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. The entry into the kingdom of God, and do you recall one of the first verses we read this morning? That God has called us into his kingdom and glory. It's a glorious kingdom. It's a kingdom associated with his glory. And entering this kingdom of glory is through tribulations. But the connection between sufferings and glory is made even more uh, clear and uh, unmistakable in a couple of other places, at least, quite a few actually. But in Romans 8 and verse 18, well, 17 and 18. Romans 8, 17 and 18, Paul says, And if we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Wait a minute here. There's that last line. is rather interesting. The glory is going to be revealed. Remember when we read Titus 2.13 says, The blessed hope is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Where is this appearing of this glory taking place? Well, Paul had said in Colossians, It's Christ in you is the hope of glory. In t- Titus, the blessed hope is the glory, is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, the same author tells us where that glory is going to appear. The glory is going to be revealed in us. Uh, now, he, it's very clear, he says in verse 17 here, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. The idea is that the suffering is a necessary component to being glorified. Because we suffered that we might be glorified. The suffering and the glorifying have a cause and effect relationship. And he says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now you recognize, oh yeah, we're talking, this series is about, <laughs> is about suffering, isn't it? I forgot about that subject. Yeah, we thought we were talking about glory, something altogether different. No, we are called to glory and we are called to suffer, the Bible says. But these are not conflicting ideas. They are ideas that are parts of a whole. Uh, Here's a very important scripture that reveals the relationship between suffering and entering into glory. And remember, I'm considering glory to be a reference to the image of Christness, because as we gaze upon that glory, we're changed in that image from glory to glory. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, well, in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, he made this interesting observation. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 and 17. This is just one chapter later than the point where he said we're being changed into that image from glory to glory. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, what is the relationship of our affliction or glory? The the affliction is working glory for us, is working it into us. The inward man, the outward man is suffering, even perishing, but inwardly there's something happening. There's a renewal happening. The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed every day. And what we find is that our light afflictions are working for us likeness of Jesus. We cannot be made like Jesus without walking the road that he walked. And apparently the road he walked was a necessary road. He didn't take any unnecessary steps. God didn't put Jesus through any unnecessary paces or through any unnecessary agonies. 
It was necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory, he said. But if it was necessary for the captain of our salvation, as God was bringing many sons to glory, to send the captain ahead and make him perfect through sufferings, how much can we expect to be entering into that glory without also the like sufferings? Why would it be necessary for Christ to suffer before he enters the glory? Now, we know that Jesus suffered for our sins. We, if some say, why did Jesus have to die and suffer? We might say, well, he had to die for our sins. Okay, well, that would explain the actual event of his death. But what about all the other suffering he went through? And what about the torture and the whippings and all the other stuff that was associated with his sufferings? Were all those necessary for our salvation too? I'm not sure. The way, the way that I understand, um, y- you know, the atonement, now, all that was necessary was the shedding of his blood. Why all this other agony for him then? Why all the rejection? Why all the misunderstanding? Why all the ostracism? Why all of the, um, you know, gossip and shame and torture, really? Why all that? If all that was necessary for atonement was the shedding of his blood, that could have been done much more painlessly, could it not? I mean, he could have had his he could have been had his head cut off. That's how Paul later died. That'd be quick and painless. Why the cross? Why the sufferings of all kinds that Jesus was subjected to? Well, there was more to it than just our salvation. It was necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory. It was not merely for us that he died. It was for us, but it was for more than that. It was that he might enter into glory. This is the only path there, apparently. Now, don't ask me why that is. I I might be able to give some kind of an answer, but I'm not sure I could give the true answer. I don't know. But I will say that Jesus apparently needed, he was made perfect through the things he, he suffered. He is brought to his ultimate condition. Through suffering, it was for his good. And we're told now that our light afflictions, certainly light by comparison to his, which are but for a moment, is working for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Uh, So the glory is a product of suffering, according to these verses. Let's look over at 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Speaking to servants who are abused by their masters, he says, For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer for it, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us so that we would not have to suffer, right? No. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow or you should follow in his steps. Now, it's interesting. Paul told us that we're called to God's kingdom and called to glory. Peter says we're called to suffer and to bear it patiently for righteousness' sake. Why? Why this part? Well, Christ also suffered for us and left us an example that we should follow that example. Many people think that the suffering of Christ, what it was principally for is to procure an, uh, an exemption from suffering for us. We shouldn't have to suffer if he suffered for us. Oh, no, it says we, he suffered for us, not that we would be exempt from sufferings ourselves, but that we would follow in his steps of suffering to reach the same goal, the glory that he had that he desires to share with us. In First Peter chapter 3, Uh, Again, that we are called to suffer is mentioned. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. The calling of the Christian is to receive insults and reviling and evil from others and to return blessing, like Jesus did, in other words. To suffer as he suffered. That's our calling. Why? Because our calling is to be like him. That's the glory of God as his nature as his character is is uh, reproduced in us 
we find that that is what the glory of God in us is. And our, and our great hope is that we will be just like him. Because we know from 1 John chapter 3, in verse 2, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When Christ is revealed, we will be like him. But what, 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 how is that said in other words? Well, over in Colossians, chapter 3 and verse 4. Colossians 3, 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Interesting. John said, when he appears, we will be like him. Paul says, when he appears, we will appear with him in glory. Apparently, there is an identity of those two thoughts. In glory and like him. We will be like him in glory. Now, I'll show you something else in First Peter. This is very fascinating to me. hope that you can get excited about such things, too. It says in First Peter 4, verses 12 through 14, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy, If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, the spirit of glory is resting upon you. Why? Because that's the spirit of Christ. You're like him. His image is seen in you momentarily at that time while you are suffering as he suffered and reflecting his character in that suffering. His glory is at that moment upon you. Now, of course, the hope of the Christian is that we'll be permanently and always like him. We we just catch glimpses and and, uh, get there a little bit now. But look at uh, uh, Hebrews 12. We looked at this verse yesterday. I just want to draw something else from it today. Hebrews 12 and verse 10. It says, For they, that is our fathers, for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but we, he does it for our profit, for what result? That we may be partakers of his holiness. That's his character. That God allows us to be chastened. God allows us to endure the paces in order that we may share with him in his character, in his holiness. And the way that is put by Peter in 1 Peter 5, hope you don't get tired turning pages. I never do. That's why I'm teaching. Now, I never did get tired of turning pages. Okay? 1 Peter 5 and verse 10 says, But the God, may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, That's it again. We're called to eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God has called us to his eternal glory after you've suffered a while. Then he will do what he did with Jesus. Jesus was made perfect through sufferings. Well, he will perfect and establish and strengthen and settle you also after you've suffered a while. There is very clearly... Uh, this thread of thought throughout the Bible, and that is that suffering produces glory. At least it can. It is God's intention that it should. And that means, of course, that the suffering of the believer is to produce the image of Christ. Now, what this will look like, I don't know. It may, I mean, uh, I don't know that we're talking about some kind of supernatural uh, dawning uh, of uh, you know vis- visible radiance like it was on the face of Moses or like Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. But I think I would be quite satisfied if it meant nothing more than I could just be like him. I could just, when people see me, they see Jesus. Just like Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because in him we saw the glory of God, the glory as of the only, an only begotten of a Father. 
You see the image of the Father in him. Jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. If that could ever be said of me, that I would be the bright shining of Christ's glory and the express image of his person, that would be satisfying enough for me. I don't know that that's, I don't know what all that entails, but it's, uh, it's alluring and desirable. Let me show you a series of verses in the Old Testament and bring it over into the New to, to try to um, help you share my excitement about this. In Isaiah chapter 60, I must confess that there's more than one legitimate way that I could see these verses uh, interpreted. And therefore, I will not be dogmatic, but I'll just try to see if you can catch something from these verses. Isaiah 60, verse 1 and following says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. And his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the glory of the Lord. It's like unto a rising of the sun, like uh, the dawning of a day. It's like there's the sunrise happening here. And that sunrise is the rising of the glory of God. Where? Upon you. Where will it be seen? Upon you. What will be the result? Gentiles will come. Converts will be made. There is a glory that arises upon the people of God. Now, I said there's more than one way to understand this particular verse. And ditto with this verse I'm going to show you, Malachi chapter 4. But these are um, verses that I'm not so much intending to exegete at this point. I do that on other occasions, but I'd like to just give you a a sense of the imagery of Scripture here. It says in uh, Malachi 4.2, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow, etc., etc., and trample on the wicked, and so forth. Now, Notice the Son of Righteousness arises upon those who fear His name or to them with healing in His wings. There's a manifestation of Christ spoken of here. I'll I'll be quite honest with you. I think this passage is talking about the first coming of Christ. But the fact of the matter is that the appearance of the glory in the first coming of Christ or in the second for that matter is, is likened to the sun rising. Turn with me if you would. If you're not too tired, if you still have fingers or ends on your fingers, to Second Peter chapter 1. Here, Peter recounts the, the experience he and uh, James and John had on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he starts at verse 16 saying, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God, the Father, honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him in the holy mountain. We also have the prophetic word made more sure. This is only one of two possible translations of that clause, but... We'll not worry about that at this point. Which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star, the day star, rises in your hearts. What in the world does that mean? That this prophetic word shines like a a light giving us Uh, something to heed in this dark place until the actual fulfillment of the prophetic word. That What was that? That the day will dawn and the morning star will rise in our hearts. That's the dawning of a day. That's the the rising of, of of the glory of the Lord in our hearts. That's something that Peter looks forward to. Almost sounds almost uh, eschatological. Sounds 
sounds like, you know, the ultimate glory. When the day star, the morning star, arises in our hearts. You know, Paul said to the Galatians in uh, the fourth chapter, I believe it is, and I think it's 419, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see if I can find it here quickly. Paul said in Galatians 4.19, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Till Christ is formed in you. Till the day star, which is Christ, the morning star, arises in you. Till the glory of the Lord arises upon you. And his glory is seen upon you. Let me turn to another passage on this point, and then I'm going to have to wind this session down with some concluding thoughts. Look over at Proverbs chapter 4. And this is uh, verse 18. Proverbs 4.18 says, But the path of the just, or the righteous, is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Now, this translation is not as uh, fortunate as some. The King James Version says something very much like this, and it's clear that uh, the New King James is following the wording of the King James. In the, uh, in the King James it says, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. Uh, the actual thought of the verse, I think, is brought out a little better in some modern translations, like the New American Standard Version, which says, the, the path of the righteous is like the light of the dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Now, we read in the New Testament of the day star, the morning star rising in our hearts. We read of the glory of the Lord arising upon his people. We read of the glory that is to be revealed in us. We read all of these things in the scriptures. And now we read that the path of the righteous person, the life of the Christian, is like the dawn. The light of the dawn gets brighter and brighter as the night gives way to the rays of the emerging sun in the east. And in doing so, uh, you see the day getting brighter and brighter until the sun is actually visible, until the sun comes over the the hill. Now, anyone who's been around at dawn, if any of you wake up that early, if you happen to notice the eastern sky before the sun appears, it's plenty light. It gets very light before the sun is actually visible. Uh, the, the black sky lightens up to a dark blue, which lightens to a lighter blue. Then you begin to see some tinges of orange and even yellow. And the sky is about as bright as full day, even though you don't see the sun yet. And then, shortly after that, the sun appears, and it's full day. And this is that which Proverbs compares the Christian's life to, is that it's a growing light. It's like the light of the dawn that shines more and more until the full day, brighter and brighter. And I am of the opinion that the coming of Christ is like the full day. When Jesus returns, he will be visible. He's the son of righteousness. He will arise. He will, he will be seen with every eye. Every eye shall see him. I believe, of course, in the personal second coming of Jesus Christ. The question is, what do I believe will transpire leading up to that? Many people think that Jesus will come suddenly at the darkest moment in history. In fact, during the Battle of Armageddon, when the the world is ruled by Antichrist and the people of God have been driven uh, totally into darkness and into persecution if there is any surviving that have been killed, and Israel will be at its, uh, you know, uh, in its most extreme hour, and the world will be in its darkest moment, and then Jesus will appear. This is how some people read eschatology. However, it looks to me more likely that as Jesus 
appearance is, is drawing near, that the glory of the Lord will be arising like the light of the dawn. There, it'll get brighter and brighter from glory to glory into that same image that upon the people of God, I suspect, there will be a greater and greater holiness, a greater and greater Christ-likeness, a greater and greater testimony of the glory of Christ and his image seen upon us. And I would speculate a little, but I don't think it's a, a risky speculation, though it is certainly, it'll certainly come across as radical. And I, I will just tell you by way of introduction to this comment, if you'll turn to Matthew 24, I have uh, never heard anyone say what I'm about to say, except me. That doesn't mean no one else has said it. I've just never heard anyone say it. I'm not aware if anyone else has said this. And this is something that uh, I, I almost am very fearful about saying because it's so different from what most people seem to believe the Bible teaches about this verse. But um, nonetheless, it seems to me as if this is true. Um, in Matthew 24... Verse 27, Jesus said, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It's probable that when we study eschatology, I made this point from this verse. But I always puzzled over it when I was younger. What does it mean, the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west? I've never observed that to be the case. And he's not trying to make some kind of revelatory statement about lightning. He's, he's, he's using a common, well-known phenomenon as an example of something that he's going to give some teaching on, namely the coming of the Son of Man. And he says, it's like, well, it's like what the lightning that shines from the east and comes across flashes to the west. Well, has anybody ever observed that to be a, 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 a typical pattern for lightning to go from the east to the west? I, I have not observed it. I've never read that this is the case. And yet, every translation of the Bible I've ever seen translates it just the same way. But I was once thinking about this verse and wondering whether the word lightning had any possible other meaning than just like a bolt of lightning, like we think of an electrical storm and lightning in that sense. And uh, I didn't know, and I was not near a concordance or, anything, or a uh, lexicon uh, when I was thinking this, but... I thought, I wonder if the word lightning in the Greek could have the meaning of sort of like lighting a room. I mean, uh, there is a lightning of this room by these lights overhead here. It is lightened. And therefore, there is a lightning here in this room of, uh, from these lamps. There's the shining of the lamps. And I thought, if this were so, it could change a great deal in terms of the meaning of that verse. And so I later checked in the lexicon and found it that it is in fact so. The word lightning that is used as the lightning shines from the east to the west is the word astrape in the Greek. And if you'll look in a lexicon, you'll find that that word has its principal meaning as lightning and its secondary meaning as bright shining. Not just a bolt of lightning as we use the word, but in the sense of a bright shining. In fact, I learned that that is the exact meaning of that word in another passage. In Luke chapter 11, <coughs> verse 36. <clears throat> in Luke 11 and verse 36, Jesus said, If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Can you find the word estrape in that sentence? I've given enough clues, I'm sure you can. The words, the bright shining, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. That, that, those words, bright shining, translate the Greek word astrape, the same word that is translated lightning in Matthew 24, 27, but there's no ambiguity of the word here because you can't say just as the lightning of a lamp and mean a bolt of lightning. You have to mean bright shining in this case. The word can only mean that here. It may be ambiguous in other places, but not here. So that astrape here means the bright shining of a lamp. Suppose we postulate, as a working hypothesis, that maybe astrape is used in that sense in Matthew 24, 27. When the, uh, as a bright shining. Suppose Jesus said, for as the bright shining 
comes from the east and flashes to the west, would that make sense? What, what, what translation makes more sense to you? As the lightning shines from the east and flashes the west, or as the bright shining comes from the east and shines to the west? Well, quite obviously, the second statement is a reference to the sunrise. A very common phenomenon. There's no one would scratch there and say, what do you mean by that? Everyone knows that the sunrise is a bright shining that comes from the east and moves across the sky to the west. But the idea of a lightning bolt going from east to west is not at all uh, axiomatic, that's for sure. And, and it hardly seems likely to be the best translation. Now, I'm saying I've never heard anyone else say this. I've never found a translator who agrees with me on this. But I'm saying the word is used in elsewhere in Scripture to mean a bright shining. Why couldn't it be here? Why not make sense of the verse? <laughs> Why not make the verse read in a way that conveys information? Now, of course, if this is right, if he says it's like the bright shining that comes from the east and shines to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then that changes a great deal of our imagery about the second coming because if it's a lightning bolt, what, what is the characteristic of a lightning bolt if not suddenness? I mean, I've... Uh, I've heard people say, you know, uh, Jesus' coming is, is so sudden, it's like a lightning bolt. Well, there is a suddenness about some part of it. In a, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. But leading up to that moment, what? Before Jesus actually appears, before the sun is seen in the sky, before full day, what, what comes before that? The path of the righteous becomes brighter and brighter until the full day. And his coming then could be likened to a sunrise. That before the sun is visible himself, his light is very dominant. Not politically, I'm not talking about that. I'm just, it is, it is uh, very uh, hard to miss, very, very obvious. His light, the light of the sun is very obvious before the sun itself is in, is, makes its appearance in the morning. And so also before Jesus appears, my impression is that the church, the people of God, will be more like him than they are now. And that there will be the glory of the Lord seen even before Jesus himself. The appearing of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ will appear upon us even before our Lord Jesus Christ himself appears. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but it seems like there's a number of scriptures that we've looked at that may point us into this particular direction, but I'm in, in connection with our study in this series about suffering and the fact that the scripture teaches that glory is a product and a result of suffering. If, if by glory we mean the glory of Jesus, the likeness and the image and the character of Jesus, if that is a product of suffering and if there is to be a more brilliant glory in the church than has yet been seen, then it might be uh, deduced that there might be some suffering for the church ahead uh, that is perhaps even greater than we've seen before. If there is a greater glory, perhaps there may be a greater suffering. I don't know. In any case, moving our thoughts away from eschatology and from the end times and all of that and, and how things will materialize, I guess a lot of that remains to be seen when the Lord comes. We'll know then. But to the personal level, what about you being changed from glory to glory into that same image. Well, how does that happen? It's our light affliction that is but for a moment works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. To be made more like Jesus cannot be accomplished without suffering. Thomas Watson said in his book uh, All Things for Good, he said, Christ was crowned with thorns and we expect to be crowned with roses how can we be like him if we don't suffer with him? And if we don't suffer all the same kinds of sufferings. Remember I said yesterday, there's various kinds of sufferings. Uh, there's chastening. Of course, Jesus couldn't be chastened for his sins because he didn't commit any. But we do. And we need to be chastened for those. But there's also bearing the cross. There's also that suffering that comes upon a man for his righteous choices. Jesus certainly suffered that way. And he took a cross. He said, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
And there's, of course, those ordinary sufferings. Bad weather, uncomfortable temperatures, you know, I mean, sickness. Uh, I don't know how much of those things Jesus experienced. I mean, I don't know if he experienced sickness. There are many who would say that he, uh, they'd almost consider it blasphemy. That he, that he, if I suggest that he may have gotten sick, that he got, went, had all those childhood diseases when he was a child that others had. I don't know if he did or not. I just don't know. The Bible does say he was tempted in all points as we are, and and uh, and we do have reason to believe that the miraculous element of his ministry didn't begin until he was an adult. And therefore, I don't know of any real reason why we could say with certainty Jesus, as at least in his youth, never got sick. Other people did. He lived in a world full of viruses. He didn't have a supernatural body. He was you know, God in the flesh, but the flesh was still flesh, subject to things that God is not generally subject to, like sleepiness, hunger, thirst for water, and so forth. Jesus experienced all those things, as the Bible says. Those are a form of suffering that comes from being in flesh. I'm not sure that his flesh wasn't subject to sore throats and eye strain and and, uh, you know, viruses and things like that, too. His flesh was flesh. Now, the reason that some people almost would think it blasphemous to suggest that Jesus may at some time in his life have experienced sickness is because there's a general feeling among many in the body of Christ today that almost equates sickness with sin. Now, I'm not saying that people are so crass as to say that if you're suffering, you are sinning. That's what Job's counselors thought. And there are many people who suspect such things, if, even if they don't say so. But there's a more civil way of saying that. You, you don't have to make the person feel so bad as to go up to a suffering person and say, you're sinning by suffering. But there is the way of saying, well, if you were, if you had enough faith, you would not be suffering in this way. Now, you put it together. You don't have enough faith. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Okay, so you are actually suffering because you're sinning. It's just a more roundabout way of saying it. There are people who believe that Jesus, when he died, died not only to deliver us from all sin, but from all sickness as well. And they use a verse or two in Isaiah to prove the point, and I'll talk about that in another setting when we talk about the Word of Faith teaching, because that's not what they teach. <clears throat> but I've heard many teachers indicate that God has as much hatred for sickness as he has for sin. And if that is true, then we know Jesus never sinned. Uh, to suggest he ever sinned would be seemingly blasphemy. Some people would think it almost equally blasphemy to say he was ever sick, but why? There's no moral stigma to being sick. Good people can be sick. There's nothing wrong between you and God because you're sick. And there's nothing wrong between you and God because you suffer. Jesus suffered a great number of things, and in order to be like him, we cannot hope to avoid all suffering and the things that God did in Jesus, making him perfect through suffering. We may well have to go through some of the same paces. After all, what God is doing is training up royal seed. He's training us to rule with him, to be like him. We can't rule unless we're like him. Can you imagine giving the rule of a country... Well, make it even less terrible. The rule of a family to a four-year-old. Okay, four-year-old, you're going to rule the family. We'll do everything you say. Well, the family would fall apart and and the health would go to pieces and you know everything would be terrible because a child doesn't have the maturity and the character to to govern. And you know the Bible talks about nations who's under the judgment of God because the children are their rulers. And there were some nations, including Judah and Israel, that had or especially Judah, not Israel, but had boy kings. Uh, that's not considered to be desirable. And likewise, you don't put people who are carnal and self-centered and sinful by habit in control of the universe. Now, there's no question that the Bible teaches we are going to reign with Christ, but not as we are now. I mean, you... Some people might think, oh boy, I can't wait to reign with Christ when I can, then I can just have all the things I want and, and I'll be the ruler around here and everyone will do what I say and I'll, you know, get in my way. You know, you can't put a person in rule that way over the universe because people with that kind of self-centeredness would destroy the universe if they were ruling it. But we are going to rule it, but not like we are now. 
not as such persons as we are now. We need to be transformed into the image of Christ, into his likeness. Christ can be trusted ruling the universe. He won't bring any disasters upon it because he is self-giving. He is not self-serving. He said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Until we are in that state like him, until we have that glory of Christ's likeness, that we are not here to be served, but to serve and to give our lives for others, uh, we are not fit for glory. And there's a whole bunch of people out there who are exulting in the fact that we're going to reign and we're going to rule and we're, it's a real triumphalist attitude in certain parts of the body of Christ. Uh, but there's not an awful lot of appreciation in those sectors of the fact that, well, we're not ready yet and suffering is the path for becoming ready. God cannot entrust such authority and power to persons who are as carnal as many of us still tend to be. And therefore, God is chipping the stones. The stones are being re made ready at the quarry. And then they will be assembled when they have been perfected. Now, you might say, Steve, are you saying that uh, I can't go to heaven until I have been made perfect? Well, I'll, I'll leave that to God to judge. I don't believe anyone becomes perfect in the sense of um, flawless. I believe, though, your heart can be perfect, and it's the heart that's the matter that God's working on. God is more concerned about the heart than virtually anything else in your life. I think your heart can be perfectly the Lord's. Perfect means complete. If your heart's not completely the Lord's, I don't know, maybe you won't go to heaven. Uh, God may be more gracious uh, about some of these things than I'm aware of, but judging from Scripture, it sounds like God's blessings are for those who are wholly His, whose hearts are perfectly His. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward Him. And uh, so our hearts have to be perfectly His, and if they're not yet, He works on that. He takes out the chisel and He gets rid of the imperfections. And you know, it's sort of like he's sculpting a replica of Jesus out of us. He takes this stone out of the quarry, and it's in its natural state, not acceptable, not the right shape at all. And so he takes out a chisel, and the chisel he uses is suffering. And chiseling hurts, but it does good. It is good for me that I was afflicted, the psalmist says. And the affliction is intended to change us. Somebody was once asked, a sculptor was once asked, is it difficult to sculpt an ele elephant? And he said, no, not at all difficult. You just take a block of marble and chip away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. Now, I suppose the sculptor can only say that meaningfully if he really has a vision for that stone. He can see the elephant in it, you know? If you and I went into the sculptor's studio and saw that stone before it was chipped, he said, I don't see any elephant here. But the sculptor sees the elephant. And he just chips away everything that doesn't look like the elephant. And what God is doing with us, he takes uncarved, unfinished, raw materials when we're converted. And he begins to chip away everything that doesn't look like Jesus. And that is what suffering is for. That's what suffering is to accomplish. The next time, I'm going to detail for you from Scripture the specific advantages that the Bible mentions, specific details of advantages that the Bible says that suffering accomplishes in the life of a trusting Christian. And uh, I hope to give you a real, a real sales pitch for suffering. You know, I'll show you all the advantages of if you buy into this thing. Uh, but you, it doesn't matter if you buy into it or not, you're going to suffer. And uh, ditching Christ won't prevent that either. You see, unbelievers suffer and believers suffer. The only difference is believers suffer for a reason and can gain from it. Unbelievers just suffer. And that's the great tragedy of not being in the will of God. If you are in the will of God, you may suffer more or less or about the same as you would if you were not in the will of God. The difference is in the will of God, your sufferings work for you an eternal weight of glory. And so we will talk about what some of those benefits are that God has promised the next time.